please don't make a jungle city metaphor. Please don't make a jungle city metaphor. Please don't make a jungle city. God damn it, I told you not to make that metaphor. As loud as this fucking predator is, I can't figure out why no one ever hears it approaching. Yet another open conflict. Oh, this, get me out of here. Apparently in seven short years, reporters will be in the field covering shootouts instead of simply helicoptering over that shit. I'm not rooting for the bad guys, but I still don't understand why if the weapon that could take out a fucking cop car was an option, it wasn't the weapon they started off the gunfight with. Tony Pope, live with hardcore, on the scene and in your face. I'm telling you, very few things date your movie more than having Morton Downey Jr. play a shit stain of a reporter. Mr. Mayor, on vacation in your home in Lake Tahoe, get off your butt, get, get down here, and declare martial law! Predator 2 is set in the future, 1997, so maybe some laws have changed, but the mayor cannot declare martial law. That would be the governor decision. And unfortunately, the governor of California in 1997 was not Arnold Schwarzenegger. Now I'm going to send the space-time continuum for not allowing me to have even more fun with the sin than normal. What is the point of having this gun up here when you have all these just scattered throughout the trunk? Mike thinks this is a good idea, and he survives this. Hey, asshole! Why would Mike alert these guys to his presence? Just shoot them in the back and move on with your day. Not sure I've seen a dumber f***ing character choice in an action movie than this. And I've seen Showdown in Little Tokyo twice. Also, they somehow heard of him, despite being in a deafening world of decibels on top of decibels f***ing other decibels. Come and get it! The stuff you is ready! Apparently, cocaine makes this guy speak English after speaking only Spanish just a second ago. Luckily, for the plot of this movie, the drug dealer's ammo room is located on the top floor of this building, directly under a skylight. I hear a Gotham contractor built this place. El Scorpio comes out of the room, guns blazing, but wasn't this entire room blasted out a minute ago? How the f*** did he live through that? And at the very least, how did he escape that explosion without at least getting terribly injured? Are you telling me it's the cocaine? It takes three edits to show this guy falling down, all at pretty much the same angle. This is one of the sweatiest movies this side of the postman always strings twice. It's as if someone took body heat in the long hot summer, Johnson and Madsen, not Newman and Woodward, and wrung them dry of all their drippings onto Danny Glover and Reuben Blades, and had plenty left over for Maria Conchita Alonso. Bill Paxton provided his own sweat because he's a professional. Quite possibly the most ridiculous thing to happen in this movie is that this table was able to sustain a grown ass man falling on it from 20 or so stories up. They've been cut to pieces. Must be the Jamaicans. They haven't been cut to pieces. They've had their chests ripped open as if an alien popped out of them. Is chest pouring a common practice with the Jamaican gangs? Because I doubt it is. And that is a ridiculous thing for a Cantrell to say. How did the Predator even have enough time to perform one of its hanging human rituals? It was still pursuing El Scorpio when Mike and everyone got to the room. That's about 35, 40 feet. No rope, no ladder. The guy weights about 190, 195 pounds. Yeah, you should already be well on the way to the this isn't human, at the very least supernatural, and maybe it's a fucking alien track. But you're not, because this movie is dumb. This is not good, Mike. Not good at all. This guy states the obvious so confidently he grows up to be Troy Aikman. Does no one mention anything about the hanging corpse going missing later? Also, why does the Predator take this body and leave all the Jamaican gang members it hangs up in skins at the next mass murder? You let me down, Mike. You're making me look bad. Robert Davi plays an asshole in a movie released between 1988 and 1995, cliche. Yet you disobeyed a direct order to stay out of the building. If you grew up watching cop movies during the 80s and 90s, I think you saw some version of this scene 3.2 million times. This helicopter flies into a street scattered with people and just lands without a care in the world. This is more insane than the copters dropping people off in the middle of New York City in Conspiracy Theory, which oddly enough could have been a movie people in this film were watching since it was released in 1997. I'm not sure if I'm sending the fact that there is a line going into a police station or that people would actually wait in a line to go into a police station. And all you gotta do is tee it high and let it fly. Bill Paxton shows up in a sequel to a popular film about aliens cliche. Heinemann's already been up my ass so far. I won't be able to sit down for a week. I realize this is an exaggeration, but it's hard to take you seriously when you say something that ludicrous while you're literally sitting down. You will extend him your full cooperation. Which means you cut it off my dick and shoving it up my ass. This is either way worse or way better, but it cannot be the same. Captain Pilgrim, Peter Keys. I've read that this character started off as Dutch, the role Arnold Schwarzenegger played in the original, and I'm sure they wanted Arnie back, but what I'm having a hard time figuring out is how they went from, well, we can't get Schwarzenegger, to, I guess our only option is to bring in Busey. Like your last partner got shot? <laughs> <laughs> you try that cowboy sh with me, and you can kiss this goodbye. 
Sure, Jerry is kind of a dick, but I have no idea why this scene exists other than to show that Leona is tough, which is evidence we don't need. I don't see why Jerry's partner getting shot is his fault. It's not like he was hitting on her. He was just telling her a story about a woman who killed her husband. I see that the three of you have met. Why is nearly this entire scene being shot from behind the window? And the reflection from inside the room is getting more screen space than the characters outside. Till now, it's all been fun and games, cops and robbers, Dunkin' Donuts. <laughs> Not unless we're in 2015, because that's when the first Dunkin' Donuts opened in L.A. <gasps> Jesus Christ, is this woman having sex and jumping on a pogo stick at the same time? It's really odd and super convenient that the Jamaican gang hangs people up exactly like the Predators do, so it can take the cops even longer to realize they're looking for an unrelated third party. Voodoo magic. What I want to know is who has to carry all the pieces to make the voodoo magic happen. There are bowls, candles, altars, and something to carry the blood in. That's a lot of baggage to be hauling around the streets just to make a power move. The overhead alone on these excursions honestly doesn't seem worth it. I feel like the only reason the Predator showed up in this scene is because it read the script. Predator heard about the gang war between the Colombians and the Jamaicans and decided, yeah, I can insert myself into that. What exactly the fuck is this guy shooting at? He's got his gun down by his hips and he's just looking around like a guy who's about to get killed by the Predator even though he can't possibly know that's what's happening or what the hell a Predator is. Also, this scene is so badly green screened and edited that the only way I knew what happened to this dude was to watch it frame by frame. And I think the Predator sticks his claws in him and lifts him off the ground, but the movie actively hates your eyes as it cuts from one thing to the next. Why would the Predator ever uncamouflage himself? He doesn't need to, and he will always have the advantage if he stays invisible. Federal officers will handle investigation. We didn't hear that. Let's go. Classic movie cop from this era does something that he was just told not to do and warned about earlier. Now, I understand why he does it, but considering that they just hired Gary Busey to tag along on these things, why the f*** isn't he here? Look familiar? Ha! This body was visible as soon as you guys opened the door, so I don't know why you're scared by it. The audience didn't get a good look at it, so maybe they're supposed to be scared because their vision is limited by what the camera sees, but you supposedly have a full 3D view of everything. Who the hell is King Willie? How would Lambert not have any clue who King Willie is? And if he didn't, someone sure as hell should have briefed him on King Willie on the way down. I don't know, she's not making any sense. You cast this woman to gyrate unrealistically while having sex and kept her unclothed the entire time she was on screen, but when it comes time for her to do something for the plot, you make her say vague shit like, the devil came for them. Of course, if she was more accurate, she'd say something like, a guy who looked like scrambled cable came in and killed everybody. So maybe it's for the best that she speaks in riddles. Jerry gets video footage of the feds taking the drug lord's girlfriend, and despite a guy shining a flashlight right at him, he somehow took all of this footage unseen. Now right. tomorrow, start a tale on keys. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Look, we know something is odd about the feds' involvement in this case, but Mike hasn't once told anyone why his constant insubordination is justified. Usually there's an incident or a piece of information that drives these guys to go rogue. In this, he's been insubordinate from the very beginning. Who are you really chasing keys? Honestly, it's none of Mike's business who keys is really chasing. But since we're in the year 1990 and we've seen so many cops do the wrong thing and be called heroes for it, we're not going to question it one bit. And since we've already seen Gary Busey try to kill Danny Glover and leave a weapon, we are primed to agree with what Mike does here, whether it makes any sense or not. Danny is going to get back into the crime scene with no issue. And I'm sure he has the means to pick a lock and whatnot, but Keyes doesn't have anyone keeping guard at this location. At the very least, you would think he'd have a van detail, making sure the Predator doesn't show up again, which it f***ing does. If there was police tape covering the elevator of this place, why would you bother with even more tape in front of yet another door? If a trespasser didn't get the message the first time, what's the second gonna do? Thankfully, this apartment was decked out with decorative and climbable concrete structures, in case the Predator weapons get left behind, stuck in a ceiling vent. Those LA architects really think of everything. I think it's weird that the feds who would have gone through here and shown flashlights into every nook and cranny of this place somehow missed this predator throwing knife. Danny boy. Why did the predator wait till Danny got all the way up here to f with him? Could have skipped all the effort and just been murdered on the ground. Predators are dicks, man. Every time this movie does its awful green screen work and cuts to the weird predator vision all in the same sequence, I am disappointed that I can't go back in time to tell the filmmakers not to do that. <laughs> this profile of Mike says his aggression level is 40% above average, and I'm not sure how you quantify that, especially in the LAPD. Also, his file misspells harassment, and I just can't let that go. If it were up to the chief, he'd charge you with Detective Archuleta's death and suspend you. F***ing what? I could see Mike getting charged with negligence, since Danny was acting under his orders, but the f***ing murder? And if that's possible, f***ing hell, why would anyone want to be a cop? Whoever killed him is gonna pay. I'm gonna finish it. And that's the end of that conversation. You know who the chief of police really is? It's Mike, apparently. Mike threatens a federal agent and nobody comes to break it up and probably arrest Mike over it. What are the chances that three red 1965 Ford Mustangs would all be in the same area all at once? And then this morning, I lost him. Lost him where? 
burning an industry. The slaughterhouse district? Jerry loses his keys in the slaughterhouse district. I am the medical examiner and the chief pathologist in the city, and they've cut me out completely. Obviously not. They let you examine Danny, the predator's latest victim. Doctor, I pried this from Danny's hands. This is what took him up into the rafters. How did Danny hold onto the knife when death was instantaneous and while he was getting boned like a fish? Astonishing. This material doesn't correspond to anything on the periodic table. What's even more astonishing is that the doctor gives the spearhead back to Danny and doesn't ask to keep it for further investigation. You might have just discovered a new element. What the f*** are you doing? How did King Willie's men know exactly where Mike would be at this moment? You want me to follow you? If that was a legit question, I'm pretty sure Mike would like you to ask it quieter next time. Most of King Willie's men would have easily heard that. There are a lot of these. In case you forgot there was a predator in this movie, here's a random shot of him moments. And the movie has f***ing predator in the title. We haven't forgotten about the predator. We have forgotten a will to live while watching this movie, but we haven't forgotten that there is an alien presence. Or swings both ways, my ass. I get the distinct feeling we'll never be told why the predator is stalking the detectives or why it killed people in two different gangs. At the end, we're supposed to understand that the predator has been stalking 44-year-old Danny Glover because he's the standard by which predators judge warriors. And I mean, I like Danny Glover and all, but seriously? This thing that's killing your people and mine is from the other side. We spent a lot of time on Mike getting driven out to King Willie, only to find out he has absolutely no information whatsoever. The scene is essentially worthless, except the Predator shows up and randomly kills King Willie after Mike leaves. God knows how he followed the car here since it drove off and he was miles away earlier. I get the distinct feeling the only reason Willie gets attacked is because the filmmakers knew this scene was worthless and they needed to make it count somehow. His foundation laid in the holy mountain. This scene might have been badass in a movie where the gangs took center stage and it didn't focus on the stupid federal agents and the weird LAPD hierarchy. There's definitely something slippery about our brother Keys. Since none of these three are supposed to be pursuing this case, I find it odd they will talk to Mike on speaker in the middle of the precinct. The federal authorities erased everything from the computer file except for this. My question is, why did they put anything in the computer file in the first place if they were just going to erase it a day later? How do you get paranoid about evidence being left on a computer but not paranoid about putting it on a computer in the first place? Juxtapositions. Also, I realize Mike's interest in this display could be case related, but I like to think it's because he remembers the days when he just wanted to be a simple taxidermist. But then he killed his mother and propped up her skeleton by the bedroom window, and after that, lost interest in the art. Want some candy? Whoa there, Mr. Predator. Strangers should never take candy from kids. If you need any further proof that Mike is not a very good cop, let's take this scene where he leaves Danny's police badge behind on his grave that anyone could steal and use to impersonate a cop. Danny's necklace. Whispering exposition about an item that we already know about and who it belongs to. There are some movies that might need to hold the audience's hand more than others, but I assure you, f***ing Predator 2 isn't one of them. We got this one, guys. God, I hate the subway at rush hour. You know, it's hard enough to find a seat. Except this subway only looks about half crowded, and there appear to be plenty of seats open. I'm sure they just couldn't get enough extras to fill the car up, but why keep the dialogue? <laughs> Predator 2 asks, which movie from the early 90s is the funniest parody of Los Angeles? This or L.A. Story? Drop it. What the hell is that? If the Predator is purposely going after Lambert and Cantrell to get Mike more revved up, I guess that makes sense. But I'm still confused how the Predator knew they were on the subway train. I guess it could have been listening to Mike on the phone, but how does take the Metro Long Beach line mean anything to the Predator? I know he picks up on some English, but he also studied the city's public transportation systems in detail? Get out of the way! Forget everything you saw during the subway scene, because chances are you didn't see shit. Even though I can't see shit during this entire subway scene, I can, for some reason, see the shadow of the camera operator here. So, 53 seconds of walking. The Predator decides not to kill Leona because it performs an ultrasound on her and discovers an unarmed fetus. And that's just some bullshit because from what we've seen so far, everyone in LA comes out of the womb carrying a Glock. Picking up fetal hot zones. This woman is pregnant. And Mike finding out this information adds nothing to this movie and it's never brought up again, so why is this pregnancy? A mass slaughter just happened on a train and this asshole is gonna walk down a lonely subway tunnel by himself because he has 40% more aggression than other cops and that's all you need. If there was ever a character that needed to run away, it's this indestructible asshole who just got shot 50 times and killed a whole train full of people. Mike fruitlessly looks to the sky to find the nearly invisible predator, crashes through a barrier of some sort, and magically ends up in a place where he can spot it. The fact that this Miller Lite product placement serves as America's light, in that it's a light that allows Mike to see the Predator, is clever enough to earn an additional sin. And once again, the Predator is randomly not camouflaged as it King Kongs its way up this building and there is no good reason for it. So he already got the skin off Lambert's skull? Last time the Predator had a whole process that it had to do on its ship. Did it remember to bring the portable de-skinner today? <laughs> By the power of Grayskull, what the f*** is this movie all of a sudden? Predlander? Community. 
I got something you might find interesting. And you might find it odd that the last time I said I was going to make you disappear if you interfered, and now that you have, I'm instead showing you all the evidence of alien life on this planet. Some people in this business call this classic keys. How many times do I have to tell you, you don't know what you're dealing with? Yeah, but telling somebody this kind of vague shit doesn't really tell them anything. There hasn't been much point in keeping Mike in the dark the whole time, other than for movie purposes. You guys are supposedly on the same team, so wouldn't it have been best to just tell him about the Predator from the beginning? Why would you assign Mike's team to report to Keys when Mike's main focus is drug gangs? Ten years ago, one of his kind stalked and eliminated an elite special forces crew in Central America. By the way, why did this movie jump ten years to 1997 when nothing about this requires making a leap into the future? If this was set in 1990 LA, what would have been the difference? You admire the son of a bitch. Not what he does, Lieutenant. For what he is. For what he can give us. They might as well have cast Paul Reiser in this role, because Keys is just Burke with a Gary Busey face. Mr. Garber, we're picking up something on the pheromone scanners. These dicks have pheromone scanners to tell them wherever the Predator is, and yet they somehow have been behind the eight ball every single time the Predator's shown up anywhere in this movie. This whole scene is basically from the movie Aliens, from the large, desolate area the soldiers have to investigate, to the flashlights and weapons, to the body cameras, to the indecisive guy when the soldiers are in trouble, to the very moment where the alien is right above them and nobody can see him. The only thing that's missing is Bill Paxton yelling, Game over, man! Game over! But the movie already killed his ass off, so he can't do an encore. I guess there's nothing wrong with trying to be aliens, but goddamn, is this ever trying to be aliens? How did Keyes or any of his men not realize the flashlights would give off a heat signature as well? Also, the Predator can clearly hear, so while the special suits might work to a point, this plan is far from foolproof. I guess better safe than sorry, but it's funny to me that Mike thinks a simple bulletproof vest will stop the Predator weapon that blows a giant hole through your chest. I know Mike is driven to get revenge because of Danny, but what is his plan? He's seen the Predator kill everyone, even kill entire teams of people, and he thinks he can take this f***er alone? Can he not call for backup at least? Predator has the same weakness as the aliens from Science. When exactly does hypothermia set in? Because as cold as that freezer has to be, the water could only be making it worse. This bomb the Predator lobs at Mike lodges directly into his midsection and then immediately explodes. And sure, he's wearing a bulletproof vest, but I'm not sure how highly rated they are against Predator bombs. Also, fun with freeze frames. This guy is so not Danny Glover, you might as well call him Donald Glover. And after the bomb goes off, it'll burn him to a Crispin Glover. And once I figure out a way to get Julian Glover into this sin, he's making an appearance too. I'm no expert on Predator anatomy, but I'm still throwing in a Predator survives this sin and you can't stop me. I mean, you probably could. I don't want to physically fight about it. Oh sh are we about to find out that the guy behind this the whole time was the curator, Mr. Wiggles? You are one ugly mother. We've got callbacks, y'all. Also, body shaming. <laughs> How is the Predator seeing Mike with its full infrared vision when it no longer has its mask on? When the Predator in the 1987 film had its mask off, it could only see everything in red. But here, he can see the red and the green. Guess who's back? That 100% feels like a line written with the intention to have Schwarzenegger returning as Dutch, which would still be stupid because this isn't the same Predator. Regardless, why would the Predator give a shit about Keys? He probably already forgot about him, if he thought about him at all. Get out of here, arrogant. I want to save your ass. Or, and just go with me on this for a second, you could work together as a team. Throughout this movie, the Predator has had a little red laser triangle dot thing that he's used several times for easy kills, but here, why win? <laughs> These pigeons apparently held still during Mike's entire 25-minute walk around this roof until they needed to be jump-scaring dicks. Mike says, screw this alien javelin, let's tackle the predator and let gravity decide this. The decision to make the Predator learn phrases like the Terminator would have been great if it actually contributed anything to the plot or my enjoyment at all. Mike's reach keeps getting impossibly longer, but even if he could reach this Predator blade at this point, how the f*** is he supposed to pull it out of this rock? The movie says, not a problem. Yeah, maybe you can, but why not just go back down the way you came? Now, maybe he's too far down to make it back on the roof, but the point is, he doesn't even consider that an option or look for a way back to the top, and immediately says, well, I guess I gotta climb down this pipe. <laughs> this guy made some healing medicine using bathroom tile, drywall, and mirror glass. And yeah, I don't know how predator medicine works, but this is like he found Doc Brown's Mr. Fusion and blended beer and a banana peel to make f***ing Neosporn. <laughs> This woman is just now investigating the noise coming from the bathroom. It was at least three minutes ago that the predator came crashing through the window, and she should have already called the cops. Ah! Ah! <laughs> the hell am I? Surprisingly exactly where you need to be on the predator's f***ing shit. God damn this movie to hell. Where are you? 
asking a skilled hunter where they are and shouting it loud enough so they know exactly where you are. Literally over a minute of Mike walking through this alien ship, and it's even more boring than walking through a Bible theme park. Why is the ship foggier than a John Carpenter film from 1980? Is this a design feature you can ask for from the ship manufacturer? Alien Skull in the Predator trophy case sounds like an awesome prelude to a crossover movie series, but I'm from the future and I know better. Mike will somehow make this a fight against this now fully healed Predator on his home turf. <laughs> Holy sh**, how does the Predator make this rookie mistake? Anyway, glad Mike's 40% more violent than the average cop. Caught him! I read that Danny Glover got a lot of current Los Angeles Laker players to come in and be the Predators for this scene, and it was the first time Terry Teagle was able to contribute anything meaningful. Oh yeah, I forgot Predators were these prove-yourself-in-battle types and Mike passed the test. That's why Mike gets to live, because there's some sort of honor they're upholding there. This whole movie was so the Predator could find the alpha male and challenge him to a fight, but he sure went through a lot of nonsensical bullshit to get to this point. I can't wait to figure out the story behind this pistol in Predator 3. <laughs> Predator 3. Predator rewards Mike with a gun, but barely gives him enough time to get off the ship. Predators are dicks, man. Wait a minute. Who was the father of Leona's baby? I went to this doctor, and well, he told me I, I swallowed a lot of aggression, along with a lot of pizzas. Must be weird not having anybody on you. I have to lie to women to get laid, and, and, and I don't score much. I got a little dick. It's pathetic. Officer Murtaugh, don't be foolish. Look at the hardware. Yeah, if you come closer, we all die. Hey, Mr. Kramer, this is Langston from Regal View. I didn't catch you at the wrong time, did I? Hey, Jack, is that you? There can be only one. Look at their faces. They all look the same. It has not been a nice day! Human sacrifice, dogs and cats living together, mass hysteria. I'm too old for this shit. Phil, this is quite a surprise. What brings you down from the palace? You were very quiet when I was arrested. Remember, you're only president for life. Now this John Wayne attitude, flagrant disregard for policy is gonna end now. Because I think you're a sexist, misogynist dinosaur. A relic of the Cold War. My God damn it, this ain't your personal little war, you know? I love Granny too. Well, that's great. That's just fucking great, man. Now what the f are we supposed to do? We're some real pretty sh now, man. Capture and isolation is our objective. Let's show this prehistoric bitch how we do things downtown. 